Thank you. And shall we start this too? Sorry for the small logistics issues. So I'm Rafael Martinez. I'm from the CFA. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about the issue of uh, light curve classification, especially in the context of supervised learning and the issues that arise when you depend on a training set. Uh, this is, uh, you know, in the context of the SAMC work, uh, working group two that, uh, that uh, she's talked about earlier and also in the context of trying to come up with a data challenge that we can issue for the community to bring their own classification ideas into the problem of classifying light curves. So, uh, well, the motivation and the reason why we're all here, part of the reason why we're all here is because astronomy, of course, is entering into the time domain uh, frame. And uh, the LSST will, will be coming online in 2021. It's currently under construction in Chile. It has an eight for, eight for eight meter uh, reflector. Uh, and the idea is that it will basically take an image of every part of the visible sky from Chile every few nights in six different bands, which was one important thing that I think didn't necessarily get mentioned before, uh, for a period of 10 years. And what you see here is a little simulation of what the first year of observations may look like with uh, you know, the, the color indicating the number of visits that each patch of the sky will get. And this is around 20 visits for the, for the heart. And that will, of course, will give us an opportunity to study transients. Uh, and in particular, because it will go deep and it will go long, we will be able to f maybe discover new types of traces that we have not been dis discovered yet. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, there's the challenge and the fact that each periodic source is different and we have different types of variability in the sky. So we can have something like the C8 or RR Lyra that are periodic in the sense that they are consistent in their periods and amplitudes, so you can easily model them. Uh, they are usually used as standard candles, so they, they, uh, they can be estimate, uh, used to estimate distances in the universe and are very important for cosmology studies. There are also quasi-periodic uh, variations like mirror stars where they are dominating frequencies, but there is no consistency in either phase or amplitude or, or both. Uh, but, of course, there are also things that are not periodic at all, or that you don't expect to be periodic, such as AGNs and QSOs that basically vary without any obvious pattern, and transients that have like a peak of intensity and then go down again, like supernovae or stellar flare, flares, etc., etc., etc. And as if you see the light curves of each of those things look different, and of course the two challenges that we have is one, design the survey so that we can get as many, as much information as we can from uh, you know, the observations we take in the different filters at specific times. But also we have the issue that once we decide on the design of the, uh, of the, the survey, we need to do the best we can to classify the sources and you know, assign them classes and labels. And that's more or less what, I, what we've been thinking about uh, in the working group too. So uh, why is this a challenge? Of course, it will be a challenge first because there will be massive, massive amounts of data coming up. Uh, the order of 10 to the 9 sources for which we, ha we will have light curves, light, light curves once uh, LSST comes online. And of course, that's, that's problematic not only because of the volume of the data, but also because, as has been mentioned before, they are sparsely sampled. So they are not sampled at regular, regular intervals. Are, and also they are you know, very sparse sometimes. So there's big gaps between, between the data points here, as in this uh, example here. And there's also the fact that in the particular case of the LSST, the, simulation, the observations will not be taken simultaneously in each filter. So you will have five, six different bands, and in each band, in principle, you have different properties of the variability. Uh, and of course, uh, by design, LSST will only be able to take one filter at a time. So you have the additional challenge that you need to deal with things that, are take, that it's taken in different filters at each time. So machine learning, of course, has come up as a very useful way to deal with this situation. Uh, basically because you can learn, basically what you do when you do uh, machine learning, and one of the things you can do is uh, learn functions that map a space of features of these light curves to a space of probability for different classes. Uh, and that's one of the things that you try to do with machine learning. But you can also do things like detect outliers. So find which light curves are the weirdest with respect to you know, the population. Uh, but one issue with those uh, and this is, this is the general idea of how uh, uh, such machine learning algorithms work for the case of supervised learning. So you have uh, a training set of likers for which you can extract some features, and those for each, for each of the sources you have a vector, vector of features. 
And then you also have the labels for those sources. Uh, and you have your machine learning algorithm that can be, you know, a random forest classifier, support vector machine, and an artificial neural net network that basically tries to minimize a loss function to find, uh, to, to, to optimize that, that, uh, the parameters that go, that weight these different features and decide which features are more important in deciding which, which uh, source belongs to which class. And with that, you can have a predictive model to which you enter your new data. So once you have trained your algorithm, you can enter new, a new light curve with a feature vector, and your predictive model will give you a posterior probability for the different classes. So you can, in principle, say which, uh, which source belongs to which class. But there are a number of ways in which this process can go wrong if you don't do it properly. And, and I think this is one of the main challenges that the machine learning community faces. Uh, the first thing is, has to do with the training set itself, because it can be biased. For example, uh, you can have a training set that is biased towards the brightest sources, because they are the ones that are easier to assign labels to, either because you can take spectra for those sources, or because they are closer and they are brighter. So, you can, uh, so it, it's, 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 it's biased towards those types of sources. And also, uh, uh, rare classes can be underrepresented, so which is related to the previous point. So you can have a bias in the, in the training set. And of course, if you assume that the training set is representative of the population on which you're going to te test your, your machine learning algorithm, then you, you might end up with catastrophic mistakes in the way you get your, your labels. Uh, but also, feature extraction can be a, a, complex, a complex issue because, as was mentioned before, uh, well, features will depend on the types of sources that you want, and the best features for one type of variability might not be the best features for other types. It's also, the features are also depending on, on, on the noise, they are depending on, on, uh, on the time sampling of your light curve, and on top of that, usually feature extraction is computationally expensive, so if you want to do this for many, many sources, you are in trouble because you will have big clusters, or maybe not even a big cluster can do that for you. Uh, the labels, of course, are another issue, uh, and this is related to what I was mentioning before. How do you determine the actual ground truth classes and labels for your, for your different sources? Uh, and uh, also, it can happen that you have good labels, but that come from a different survey uh, with different properties of sampling or with different telescopes, and you might want to you might want to try to leverage the information that you have from other sources in order to do your classification of your new survey. So assigning labels is also problematic, and that's one of the, you know, one of the ideas that I want to discuss here is to what extent we can use probabilities in the training set. So that's like the question I asked before. If you don't have labels, but you have probabilities of one source in your training set being of this or that label, how can you incorporate that into your training process? Uh, so this is, this is an example of such training uh, set bias. This is uh, an example from a paper by Richards a few years ago, where you have here two space of uh, four features, a period amplitude space and the QSO-like variability and the significance of the first frequency. And in this case, the, this, uh, this uh, set of data from the HIP and OGLE uh, catalogs was used as a training set. And then the test set was the ASAS for variable stars. And you see that there are significant discrepancies between the training and the testing set. In particular, for example, the, uh, the, 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 the test set has higher density of short period, high amplitude uh, uh, you know, vari variables. And so this is, a, this is an important problem that sometimes when people apply these this, uh, machine learning algorithms don't take into account. And I think we have to be very careful about how we design a training set so that it actually represents the data we want to, try to, to do that. How can we go about this, uh, this uh, bias? Uh, how, what can we do to improve our training set? There are a number of possibilities, and I'm just mentioning a couple of them here. So one possibility is to do active learning. So you can uh, basically, once you have your train, trained algorithm and you apply to a test set, this is an example from a color-color uh, plot for, for young stars and you have something that gives you discriminators between the two. There will be some, once you apply that to an unlabeled test, test uh, source, maybe that you, you can pick the test source that are unlabeled that, give you, that will improve the performance of the, of the algorithm the most. And so you can select, for example, sources that are very close to whatever boundary you have here, so that, and you can follow them up by, for example, taking spectroscopic observations and then you can include them in the training set in the next step. So that, that way 
you can you know start to select the sources that the the, the test sources that will improve your, your your training process and incorporate them into the training set. One other interesting idea was also mentioned by by, by um, Ashish, and I hope this will get this this will get discussed uh, a little bit later in the meeting. It's uh, the domain adaptation. Basically, when you have a previous survey on which you have defined your discriminator hyperplanes here that separate your different classes, and then you have a new target uh, uh, survey where you only have labels for a few of them, you can, in principle, try to find a transformation of these hyperplanes that separate um, the sources in your, in your well-known catalog uh, to, to transform them, transform them into uh, the hyperplanes that separate the sources in your new target so that you can, by training using all these sources plus the few on, on which you have labels here, you can come up with a new hyperplane that will separate the different sources and this. And this is another interesting way uh, with the advantage that you will only need a few fraction of the sources for, uh, with labels in your, in, your, uh, in your set of interest. So, but of course we need to get started somewhere, and so we've been trying to construct a training set for which uh, that we can use uh, in this future data challenge where people will be able to apply their classification uh, schemes. And uh, we've chosen the, the SDSS Stripe 82, which is a stripe here uh, along the galactic equator that has the advantage that has, that has gone a couple of magnitudes deeper than the, than the standard SDSS observations, but also has a lot of uh, ancillary data at, at many wavelengths, so you can have uh, additional information all the way from the ultraviolet into the radio, and it's a, an interesting set to try. And of course, the SDSS has five filters, which you know makes it similar to in, in, the, in this multiband aspect with LSST. Some basic facts about that: uh, so it's five bands, about 60,000 sources, about 50 observations per per band, but there's a significant variance in that number. Uh, photometry is roughly, but not exactly, simultaneous across different bands. It's deeper, uh, and uh, there are also variability in cadence, but on average, every two days, you get a new observation of each of these sources. And here are some examples of different types of variables in the time axis here and here. Once you fold it into the phase space, and you get the different types of variability. These, these two are periodic. This one is a quasar which does not have a period, or not necessarily has a periodic behavior. And of course, we, what the first thing we did, we, we tried to merge existing classifications for these data sets. So we went, because you can, you can find the light curves online, but not for all of them you will have labels. So you want to try to find labels. And there's a number of methods in the literature for, for, uh, for, select, for assigning labels to these sources. So for example, for the RR Lyra, you can do a little bit of color selection to select your, your uh, variable stars. And then you can do uh, uh, some template fitting for the light curves and separate further the space by plotting here the magnitude, uh, the G magnitude and the variability of G magnitude, and you will separate the, the sources of your interest. For the eclipsing binaries, you usually do spectra and you do visual inspection of the, of the light curve in order to decide whether it's a, 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 an actual uh, eclipsing binary. The high, uh, high amplitude delta scuti stars, there's been some efforts to do visual inspection plus principal component analysis on, on the colors and also do a random forest classifier. And this is where my question comes. I mean, if, you, if, if your labels come from a previous classifier, how can you use the information of that previous classification that gives you probabilities uh, rather than uh, specific labels in order to incorporate that in your training process later? And of course, uh, Q QSOs are usually done with, with spectra. You can spectroscopically confirm them. So once we've uh, done that, we are trying to do the feature, the feature extraction for resources. And the first thing you want to try is to try to find periods for the different, uh, for the different uh, curves in your, in your set. So we're using this interesting approach that uses the multiband periodogram. So basically, you ha we have the, the usual uh, lumps cargo uh, idea in which you basically face your light curve and assume that once you have folded in the phase space, it will have some behavior that is sinusoidal, and you make uh, a fit of the of of a, of a um, truncated Fourier transform for that with a number of terms. The more the more terms you use, the better your fit, uh, and you get periods. But you could also do it using all the information contained in the variability of the different bands. So you, you will have, in this case, one component that deals with the overall variability of the, of this, of the source in all bands together, and then one term that uh, accounts for 
the, the, the shift or the offset of the different bands with respect to that overall variability. And in that paper by Van der Plaas and Ivesic, you can, uh, you can find that this, this method is pretty interesting in that, at least when applied to simulated data, uh, in that you, and of course there's, there's a point there regarding what happens when we apply it to real data, but when you apply the standard periodogram with each of the different bands, you get nothing from the periodogram, so there's no clear peaks in the power spectrum of the different periods, whereas when you use this, uh, this approach here, you can recover the actual, uh, the actual uh, frequency, at least multiples of the actual frequency here that in this case was around here uh, by using that. And the, thing, the, the, the advantage of that is that this is linear on the weights of the different uh, components here, so it's, it, it tends to be fast, which is something you want. As I said, feature extraction can be something that takes ages, so this is a, an interesting thing. Uh, and you can use a number of methods to avoid uh, you know, degeneracy on the determination of these parameters by using some regular, regularization approaches, so basically by assigning a prior on those thetas, so you get uh, something that is not degenerate. Uh, these are some of the results from applying that periodograms to some of the uh, Stripe 82 sources. This is together with James Long and a student uh, in Texas, uh, Virisha, who has done uh, the, the, uh, the, the period finding and then folded the, some of the light curves in the LSSD. So we're currently doing it on all the sources. We have 60,000 sources to try to estimate the periods uh, and have that period taken account for. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to discuss today was what happens uh, and what if you happen to not have any labels? I mean, what if you want to get rid of the labels either because you don't trust the labels or uh, you want to do something different? For example, you want to find outliers. So there are some interesting recent ideas on how to do unsuper unsu unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning on this kind of data sets, and, and this idea by, by uh, Baron et al. this year is a very interesting one that I've been trying to apply to this data set. So basically the idea is that you can, you, you have a space of features, this is only a demonstration, you have a, a, a couple of features here, and you have your original data that has some correlation between those features, and you have your marginal distributions. So you can actually uh, take those marginal, marginal distributions and sample, you know, draw samples from those marginal distributions to create another synthetic data uh, that has the same marginal distribution but that does not show the correlations that you see in the actual data. And then this is when you're, and, and so far you're not using labels for them, but you turn this kind of unsupervised into a supervised problem by now labeling this as real data and labeling this as synthetic data and do a random forest classifier to try to distinguish between the two. And basically what it will do is it will try to find the sources that are actually correlated and it will find the, the sources that are from the real data set. And this is a probability uh, plot of what is the probability of, of sources being from, from, this, from this type. And you see that the, that the classifier can actually find that. But the interesting thing that is that then you can define a, a distance measure uh, on, this, uh, on, 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 on this classification by looking at how how separate the, the different sources were in, the, in, the, in, the, in your decision tree, and you can kind of find a distance measure between different light curves in your classification process. So you can, in principle, find sources that are very far uh, in this distant measure from the, from the ensemble, and that will allow you to find uh, light curves that are weird uh, as compared to the, to the general, to the general uh, sample. And this is something that I recently applied to a, to a data set of uh, Kepler-like curves just to, just to try it. And this is an example of what we, what we get. So the, these blue plots here are basically the, um, the different, uh, the weirdest light curves that you get. You see that in some cases you get very, very strange variability patterns. Uh, and of course, this, in this case, it was easy because this was, this, the, the light curves in Kepler were equally spaced in time and they were also normalized. So the idea is we want to translate that into something that works also for, uh, uh, in order to find outliers in light curves that are not necessarily equally spaced in time and that are not normalized. But, but, but there are some promising, uh, promising ideas. In fact, uh, uh, one of the weird objects that we were able to find using some of these methods was, was this, this planet that uh, people have been claiming that has a, uh, a, uh, some kind of extraterrestrial structure around it because it has even a very strange light curve. So not, not all outlier detector, detector methods are able to find it, but some of them actually do that. 
Uh, so, so I just wanted to leave you with, with some additional questions regarding this, this problem I've presented here. So one thing is, in terms of the data challenge that we're planning to do, so can we try to leverage results from other existing surveys that have already labels, for example, the Catalina survey or whatever, in order to try to propose people to do a, a domain adaptation challenge? So can we, do we want to try people to try different domain adaptation t techniques to, uh, to do classification on, on our, either our data set or in the future with LSST? Uh, in terms of uh, active learning, does it make sense to try to do follow-up to some of the sources we have, for example, in the Stripe 82 um, uh, data set to try to see if we can improve the performance of the existing classifier by, by following up certain particular sources and doing spectroscopic uh, observations of them, for example. What about period finding? Do, you, do we believe that this is a, a promising approach? Uh, there are other ways to find periods and we should uh, make sure that we use the appropriate or whatever that is fast and accurate and that might be difficult to, to find, as, as, as uh, Matthew can tell you about. Uh, and also, of course, how long, you know, in principle, if we want to do classification of the LSST curve, an interesting question is how long do we need to wait along the survey before we can actually start being confident of periods uh, and of, uh, of labels assigned with the classifiers, how many data points we need to do that uh, to, to have before we can actually apply all these methods to the data set. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is what I have, so I'll uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you. So, uh, um, in reference to your second point, yeah. um, the, the follow-up from being Stripe 82 spectroscopy, could anything be gained by doing, you know, looking at Stripe 82, looking at other times, other lights? So try to look in other surveys for yeah, which. Well, I mean, you know, either Catalina, which has current Stripe 82, or you know, ZTF is looking for things to be doing. Commission. Yeah, yeah. Would would a ZTF survey of Stripe 82 right help with yes learning in some some ways like that? Right. I get, I get the idea about doing it from spectroscopic follow up, but is there some way we can use? other light curves to help with active learning, yeah. which would then be into LSST more directly. Yeah, I guess it doesn't have to be spectroscopic. I mean, this is, this is a natural way to do it for some types of sources, but it's also consuming in terms of telescope time. So yeah, in principle, whatever works. I mean, one idea that I had is try to match the Stripe 82 catalog with, for example, the Richards catalog that has probabilities of the sources and try to use that. But then again, I'm stuck with the idea of how we, do we incorporate a probabilistic training set into a training process? Uh, that, that's something that, that, that uh, I've been trying to think about a little bit, and if anyone has an, an idea of that. So if in your training set you don't have specific labels, but rather a probability, a posterior probability, how can you incorporate that? But yes, in principle, whatever that gives us a degree of certainty on the labels for these sources, uh, especially for those sources that fall close to the to the, to the hyperplanes that separate sources, that, that would be absolutely useful. Yeah. So, uh, the Stripe uh, test that you talked about, uh, so you uh, seem to have done some amount of tests by pure, using pure photometric data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but some of those objects would have spectroscopic data. So, how do the outcomes of the pure, purely photometric compare to the spectroscopic? When you yeah. put in the spectroscopic. Yeah, that's a good question, and I, I, I don't think I've or we've tried to to look into that. I certainly, for some of these sources, we will have spectra, and uh, and and you would want, you would hope that your your photometry only classifier would agree with uh, the spectra. <laughs> Uh, but that's uh, something that we have not yet done. So uh, you used the Lomskagel uh, method, and I think they were irregularly sampled data. So yes. I was wondering how you would respond to the point that Jogesh really raised earlier. Uh, I mean, he's been raising it for many oh. years <laughs> about. I don't recall what exactly the point was there. I mean, I, I, I think the, 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 the one of the main 
you know, downsides of, of this method is that it actually assumes that the light curve looks like some kind of sinusoidal uh, pattern. And of course, that can be improved as you add more, add more and more components to the truncated Fourier transform. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, this, this, this method of using the multiband uh, at least seems promising in that it is able to incorporate all bands and predicting the periods, right? at least for some of the simulated sources. But as some people have pointed out here, when you deal with real sources, um, uh, then you're in trouble because the, the noise is different or whatever is different. And that's why I was bringing up the idea of trying to do this with simulated data and then incorporate the noise. But for that, we need to in incorporate a, a pattern, a noise pattern that we actually understand, which is the other part of the problem. I mean, you could use simulations, but then you would need to understand the noise that you add to them for doing it. So, so I don't believe that this is necessarily the best approach, uh, but it's uh, a first attempt to try to, to compare what we have with what's out there and see if we can standardize the process for as many sources as we can in the training set.